Right, Chris Peaks here tonight with my man Chris Pahakis getting ready for another weekend of college football that should be exciting. Um, so I've got to ask him a question uh, that we discussed back earlier in the sp spring or summer. Um, he kind of had his doubts on me when I said this. Um, I want to know uh, if they're changing any. Um, uh, I'm saying my, that there's a good chance – your SEC East champion is going to be Kentucky. Oh, I'm in agreement now. Uh, yeah, right. when you asked me before, I didn't think they were quite ready. But that's also because I thought Georgia and Florida were going to be stronger. Okay. Um, I, I thought Georgia's performance against Auburn was pretty pathetic. Uh, Florida, I mean, my goodness. I, I wasn't expecting Kentucky to just – I mean, the score wasn't – it wasn't a huge gap. We're talking about 17, 18 points, but I felt like the game was more dominant than that. You've seen, the, yeah. over, especially over the last three, four, five years, the, mm -hmm. the talent level at Kentucky has continued mm -hmm. to rise to where mm -hmm. I'm not going to say they're going to win a national championship, mm -hmm. but they are almost in a position to where they can compete for the SEC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you recall, during the Auburn-Georgia game this weekend, I texted you and I said, I'm picking Kentucky to win the East. And, I mean, at that point, just when I saw where Georgia was, I looked at their quarterback and I didn't find him very good. And their offense seemed really weak. Um, their defense hitting what it was. They let Auburn put up a bunch of points. And I still don't – I'm still not super impressive with Auburn. Honestly, the Georgia game is the first game I really felt like they looked decent. But I think it was more because you had the blind leading the blind. You know, you had the bad news bear spring game is what the Auburn-Georgia game looked like. It was like this is – this is just, you know, each team just looks – it's like who can put together a drive without making a horrible mistake, and this, not, this it, not it, it was it was the most boring seven point game I've ever seen. Let me put it that this, way. This is not the Georgia team of the past two years. Absolutely not. I mean, I mean, this is not the Georgia team. I mean, well, I their thirty six year old quarterback graduated, um, you know, which I find <laughs> funny that in his rookie season he gets let go. And you tell me when you've ever heard this happen. Somebody in their rookie season in the NFL, when they get let go from their team for whatever personal reasons he got let go from, I don't believe they've released them. And you have the commentators say, at his age, I don't know if he'll get another chance. <laughs> I'm like, when have you ever said that about a rookie? At his age, I don't know if he'll get another chance. Like, well, he's 26, so, you know, this might be it for him, you know. But, uh, but anyway, I just had to mention that because I thought it was pretty funny. But, um, but you know, and, and t Ashford, tell me if you agree with this. Or not. I mean, besides from, like, Vanderbilt and, and, and Missouri and probably South Carolina, is this the most – is this SEC this year? Uh, is it fair to say this is the first time in a long time that it could be anybody's – the ball will actually go to it. I, I mean, mean, I really can, feel like it can. And I mean, Tennessee's still a wild card. To me, they, you, you really don't know what you're going to get from them. I mean, they mm -hmm. play really incredible one week and then the next week, you know, they look like Vanderbilt, you know, I mean, it's just not, it, it's like they look like Tennessee of last year sometimes, but then at the same time, they look like Tennessee of, 10 years ago sometimes. And, you know, I, I don't know what to get out of them. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I think they are Kentucky's only challenger. Yeah. Um, but they've got I, a tough road. I mean, they've, they've got to play Alabama at home. Yeah. Uh, that, um, yeah. I forgot to look to see if their game against Kentucky will be at home. I believe their game against Georgia this year will be in Tennessee. Um, so there's an advantage there. I mean, but they've still got a tough little road. So even if they do squeak out a win over Kentucky, 
Uh, I think Kentucky's got a good chance to still win the East, even if they lose to Tennessee. All right, so what about my Ole Miss Rebels? Man, Ole Miss, once again, LSU, do you ever know what you're going to get from them? They, you got one week, they're saying, oh, these guys are the best team in the SEC. And then the next week, they struggle. And then, then Ole Miss puts 55 points on them. You know, I turned the game off with less than like three minutes left because I thought it was over because Ole Miss turns the ball over on downs. There were like three more touchdowns. It's like that. I mean, I know that in the fourth quarter, you know, and, and Alabama mm-hmm. has this happen to them a lot. You know, defenses are tired. And it's really not about can you stop the offense from scoring or not. It's about, you know, how long will it take you to keep the offense from scoring. But but my goodness, I mean. Signature win. 55 for points. I mean, against a team that only put 10 on Alabama. So maybe Alabama is a lot better than we thought. Was um, that a signature win? You know, when a coach comes to Lane a program, Kiffin? Like, I don't yeah, know, you know, man. When a coach comes to a, you know, when a coach comes to a program and they're trying to build it up, they always have got to get that signature. I, I think and, it's huge that they didn't drop two in a row. Okay. But, I mean, I, being, I think you know, that's enormous. I mean, anytime a team loses a, two in a row, game, it's a I mean, death knell. And, you know, for him to drop the one to Alabama and then have to play LSU the very next week, I mean, that – that is I tough. think that can be considered a signature win. I mean, the one that you know starts putting him on the mark because so far, but I think if he wants to have any kind of long term career at Ole Miss, he's going to need another one. Well, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. you can't turn around and you know finish seven and five um, mm-hmm. you know, or something like that. But I mean, which I think is what's going to happen. And you know, I, I think that that's a possibility because I was looking mm-hmm. at his recruiting class last year. He recruited a lot of good players. The problem was he only yeah. gave out 14 scholarships. And now if he was could get up to 24, 25, I mean, is it possible that he could build a team that could compete? You've got a beautiful campus. I don't know. Um, maybe now that the Tuies have uh... – Lot of ended the conservatorship for, you know, Michael or maybe they can go out and recruit a few more players and get a, you know, beef up the old Miss uh, offensive line a little bit. But uh, I don't know of uh, – to me, old Miss is always going to be second fiddle. I mean, they always act like – they're threatening and they're mounting some sort of dynasty, but it just fizzles out. It's just like Auburn. You know, you, you think they've established something, but you know, know, a year or two years of of relevance and then they're back to obscurity. And Auburn is the most underachieving team in the SEC. Uh, I agree. they've They've got the, one of the best recruiting bases, Best fan bases. They've got money. They got a great stadium, and for that team to not be competing for championships in the SEC is unacceptable to me. I mean, mm. I, I just I, I, and I'm not, not to a, the the playoffs were I'm established not, not in 2014, and they're going to be ending this year, and they've yet to appear in a single playoff game. And and, and look, and I'm not. And they're not going to appear this year. Yeah. And, and but I mean you know like you said um, okay so let me get to this um, uh, uh, this uh, huge question is Jimbo's job on the line this week? No, is this a okay? No. Um, I don't think it is either. I don't think his job mm-hmm. depends on beating Alabama. If but he, I think yeah, he, I really don't think it does. He's already beat Alabama once. I don't think. But I think he's he got to win nine to prove games. That. Hmm. I think he's got to win nine games. Yeah, I mean, they're off to a decent start, you know, four and one. 
Um, mm-hmm. I don't know really how many quality wins they have. You know, that opener loss to Miami was pretty bad. Um, Man, if they hadn't lost that, they'd probably be in the top five right now. Yeah, but I don't – I just don't know. I, I haven't I, – and I, I can't recall all of their wins, but, I mean, you, the most impressive win I thought was Auburn. And, I mean, that was pretty dominant, but, I mean, it's Auburn, so – I don't know how quality that win is. Have but, we been? But if to, he if he finishes the season with three losses or less, I think he's fine. Now, if he, yeah, I mean, yeah. if he's up around five, maybe. But I just don't think Texas A and M is necessarily playing for championships. I think they're playing for the bottom line, and I'm sure they're getting it. Well, I think that the problem, too, is is they still in a position they couldn't afford to buy them out. Mm-hmm. Um, have we been um, too hard on Alabama? Because this is starting to look like an Alabama team that... that well, that, I think the being hard on them is what made them that way. Now let's not jump to conclusions. Yeah, now, if, we're jumping, you know, you know, if we're jumping, if we're jumping in the also, Alabama game, let to... me say this because you know I don't think Mississippi State was you know it's not the Mississippi State of old you know right. 2015 Dak Prescott. But um, the thing that disappointed me the most about this game is we had zero second-half touchdowns. Zero. We had nine points in the second half of this game, three field goals. Yeah, we couldn't finish drive. And that, against a higher-caliber team, is going to be a major issue. That is 12 points left on the board. One thing that that I've... Each week I keep getting more, taking more, you know, solace or I don't know, or, or uh, um, what I'm looking for is it's going to be hard to score on that defense. Mm-hmm. Um, that defense the defense for Alabama has played outstanding. It, it is a – it's probably the best defense we've had since 2015. Um, I would say it since is, 2011. Uh, they're not better than 2015. 2011. Uh, I don't think so. They're they're not. They're better than 2016. I don't think they're better than 2015. You got to remember, you got Jonathan Allen with you know double I digit think... sacks that year. You've got Tim Smith with double digit sacks that year. You've got the defense itself scoring in that, I mean, what that, that was nine of before. twelve games. Uh, okay. and you also had, I can't remember yeah. Minka Fitzpatrick with leading the league in interceptions. You yeah. had, uh, we're that, not that, 2015. That, that 2011 defense is the one uh-huh. that still stands out in my mind. They gave Correct. up eight. Touchdowns. I agree with that. Eight touchdowns mm-hmm. is all they gave up all year. Um, yeah. 2011 to me is the best they've ever had, but I think 2015 is in second. They're and... back to play in. I mean, they might not be as good as 2015 or 11, but they're back in that same quality. They're they're defense. in the ballpark. They're in the ballpark. Yeah. And the um, defensive backfield is young, and they're getting better, and they're starting to get picks. So yeah, they're they're. Yeah. That we're getting back to where we, we need they're, to do that. Yeah, we're heading the right direction. Yeah, but it's like you, you can't really, you know, you look and you got to remember what we've done the last game in three quarters is has been done without the starting middle linebacker. Yeah, and um, hopefully he'll be in the lineup this this week. But you know, I don't know. I'm t- I, I, I know I'm going to say this some is mm-hmm. Melro is one of the best I've ever seen at hitting that deep ball. And I mean, when those safeties start creeping up the line, we can run it. I expect to see a lot more, you know, strikes down through. He reminds me of the character in the movie Major League Two, the catcher that 
could throw down to second base perfect, but could not throw the ball back to the pitcher. Um, <laughs> you know, he can throw a 40, 50 yard strike, All, but without he can't him throw down. a six yard slant route. I mean, his and, receivers don't even have to slow down on a 50 yard pass. I mean, he's mm-hmm. hitting them dead in stride. Um, but, you know, the thing is, is that if all we are is a run and deep ball offense, it, I don't think that's dynamic enough to beat the better teams. So there's no, got to be some you. midfield passes, some slant yeah, routes, some out go routes. Go you know, go. he's got to be able to yeah. hit those right. seven third to 20 five, yard third routes. Sevens, those yeah. third and eights. Because um, yeah. I believe we'd be better off just a power run team. I mean, mm-hmm. right now, um, I mean, I, you know, I think I, 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 I could see a and Alabama. I think those are the top two teams in the SEC West right now. I'm not saying Auburn couldn't get it back. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I don't. I, I think LSU is. It's too okay. much of a wild card. Let me ask you about this. Um, uh, I never thought Ryan Kelly was a good fit there. Uh, I don't think Ryan Kelly is a good coach. Um, I think he is. I do. Um, I don't think he's a great – okay, let me put this this way. I think he's a good coach. I don't think he's a great coach. You don't think he's one of the elite, one of the guys? Uh, that, yeah. I mean, and I go back to the 2012 National Championship. All right, it's the national championship. It's not your game against Navy. You know, it, it's the national championship. And after Everett Goldston threw those two interceptions early in the game, each time he came to the sideline, Kelly's coaching him. It's like, hold on. You know, this is not two-a-days. This is not preseason, and it's not one of the early cupcake games. This is not even a regular season game. This is the national championship. You don't coach a player up in the national championship. I understand what you want. Yeah, and if you have to, you didn't do enough coaching in the regular season. And because he's having to talk through – the plays, I, there's one particular scene that I thought was rather funny because I voiced it. I voiced it over myself. I'll tell you what my voiceover was in a minute. But, you know, Everett Goldston comes to the line and, and Kelly's holding his hands up like this. So I know he's talking about the routes. If you're having to teach your quarterback routes oh, in the wow. national championship, well, guess what? You're about to get routed, which is exactly what happened. Now, my voiceover for watching it in real time was, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, they're wearing white jerseys. We're wearing blue jerseys. We don't Uh, want you to throw it to the guys wearing white jerseys. (laughs) Sorry, I forgot to make that clear before the game. But um, let me tell you about it. I lived in Louisiana. Oh. Those are a different breed of people. I mean, those are those folks are some different people. I mean, based on the few I know and have met, I'd agree. And I do not see him being a match to fit for those people. I could see him being on the hot seat big time next year. I thought he was a great fit at Notre Dame. But Notre Dame always wants to be bigger than they are. And, yeah. you know, they're. I think they're looking pretty good this year. I'd like to see them against a, a real team, though. You yeah. know, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I just don't feel we've seen that yet. I don't – I want to see them against a top five team. And I'm not talking about a top five preseason team. I'm talking about a team that – finishes in the top five. Um, do you, could, could you see that with Kelly though? 
I mean, him have you know, if he has a seven and five this year that he's on the hot seat next yes, year. Yes, I, I do. I think LSU does want championships, and you know, and Les Miles this. put together some of the best LSU teams the that there have ever last, been. But the they let him go because he couldn't beat Alabama and couldn't win a national championship. They are the, playing for national championships. The last two coaches they fired won national championships. Mm-hmm. I mean that 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 speaks volumes. It really does, and, and I think if 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 he loses to Alabama this year and does not win the West. Yep. I could see him being let go. After year two? I, I personally I I, think they should give him another one. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, but, 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 I, I could, complete, this you isn't know, about what's right. Or, we're not talking about what's right or what should yeah. be done. We're talking about what they're going to do. Yeah. And I bet, there's, I bet there's some alumni at Louisiana at LSU that did not like that hour to begin with. I could see that. I don't, I mean, when you look at the people who have had success at LSU, you know, I think Orgeron was mainly because they just couldn't really find anybody else. And I Man, honestly I was, think the Orgeron teams were still less miles teams. If I was a, um, um, School out there, and I'm not saying you know a major one. Mm. He would like a Baylor. They said he was at the game. I would jump all over hiring Ed Orgeron and get making sure he had a good offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, and maybe like CEO and recruit because that guy can recruit, and his players love him. And I would hire. I would hire that guy. You know, it's really a shame. What's that? Is that I had to look it up just to make sure. But it really is a shame that Les Miles does not coach college football right anywhere. And I thought the guy was an amazing coach. And he was I let too. go. Huh? I, I did too. I thought he was. Okay, I thought you case. said you disagree. I'm like, no, no, no. I want to hear your case. <laughs> no, I thought that guy was. I thought he was a great was, coach. Yeah. I thought he was a great fit for LSU. And the whole time that his, you know, the university, the alumni, whoever were casting stones at him because he couldn't beat Saban, I'm like, newsflash, during that time period, no one else could either. I mean, yeah. I mean, Les Miles did own the only win over Saban, the only quality win over Saban for quite some time when they beat him in 2011. He won two SEC titles. Two SEC titles, a national championship. Played for another one. Another one, runner-up, yeah. I mean, and it wasn't like the, the bottom fell out that he was going six and six. I mean, the guy was, you know. I mean, they were nine. They were they were nine, eleven and one every year, and their only well, loss was to Alabama. And they had a nine and three, um, mm-hmm. you know, one year. I mean, it, but you know, mm-hmm. I, 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 didn't, I didn't. I thought that was a bad fire. I didn't think Rick deserved to get fired at Georgia. I mean, it all worked out because you know Kirby's turned them in power. But I didn't think Rick deserved to be fired. You know, man. There's a phrase that's used for guys like Rick about their involvement in certain businesses. And it is great guy, too nice for this business. And, you know, Mark Rick was undoubtedly probably the best person who's ever coached college football but was he the best coach no and I think we saw evidence of that that's one thing we forgot to talk about in the Alabama game is there was a return on the sideline 
Oh, I, the, the one, <laughs> there was a return yeah, of a, yeah, I have a not from seen a bygone a era. I've not you seen know? it in a while. It, it's God. like oh there, God. there was the, the rage. raging <laughs> Saban that like, we have not that? seen. I think I think I hadn't seen him that wound up. Since probably 2013, I mean, well, I've wound up fast since then. Um, I mean, days. he, I don't but know. I'm, I'm, I want the was... Saban who threw his headset at Julio Jones. I mean, That's I mean, the one I want. I mean, I, I mean, mean the Saban against, um, Remember Western Carolina when they called the ball and they fumbled it and he went off on Kiffin on the sideline? And, and, yeah. And, okay, yeah. I forgot about the Kiffin year. Right, yeah, he was, right he was so going off the, on Kiffin left and right. Uh, That's 2014, yeah. 2019. I want, I want the Saban that threw his headphones at Julio Jones. I want the uh, Saban that spanked A.J. McCarron on the uh, sideline. The, I want the Saban that in the – that in the, the final second of a 21 nothing national championship game ran out onto the field to chew out a, a player whose name I don't even know because he committed the first penalty of that entire game when he jumped off sides on a punt with less than a minute left in the game, less than a minute left in the season. Let me tell you That's the same and I want. The fun, when he was, it was Alabama Auburn game. Right before mm. halftime, I was getting ready to kick the field goal. So he was like, they don't mm. have enough time. Or if he's mm. like, don't worry, you know, they want me to get it off. He's like, you know, they can't that do That one it. second shit, yeah. Yeah, they held the ball, they hit it. When he come off that sidelines, man, with mm. his, with his, I mean that that's the same that's the same we need. I mean that that's that, that I was that 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 touched me. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. he's back. Um, so, uh, so we'll, let's jump. Um, let's jump around. Um, ACC. Uh, where are we going? You know, I was let's see what you know. I mean, well, I think what let's talk about. Um, you want to uh, go Colorado? Yeah, that's where I want to go. Um, okay. Uh, you know, first of all, I was talking about, he goes, well, I think he still might go eight and four, seven and five. And I said, look, if he goes seven and five, what you don't, what you don't realize is mm -hmm. that is a tremendous turnaround in what he brought but to school. Let, let me present an, an alternate argument to you. Mm -hmm. This is not the same team that was the two and 10 last year. You yeah. know, because he had so many transfers. So, yeah. but I will say this. I was looking over Colorado's remaining schedule. I don't see a major threat to them until they play Utah. Um, you see the way they could be making you a game? I don't know. I, 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 I mean, so UCLA is another one of those legacy teams that are living off their resume from the 90s. Uh, they're, they're, they're living off their ability from 25 years ago. And I have not seen a halfway decent UCLA team in I don't even know how long. Hey, you I'm know, not I'm so surprised sold. because I really thought Chip Kelly would turn them into a winner. Apparently, apparently not. I mean, his, I, mean, I, 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 did, I, I just I think I the momentum has shifted. I mean, most of your West Coast players come to the ACC and the SEC. You know, and those who do stay in the West Coast go to Oregon. And if they actually yep. do stay in California, they go to USC. UCLA well, right. is not a destination for any of these guys. And it looks like that would be so easy to recruit at, at man. You're down there in Hollywood. Um these guys don't care. They wanna they wanna make it themselves. They don't want to rub shoulders with all these 
actors it's a who have made it. They want to make it in football. It's, it's, you're right, because it's a thing that's changed. You know, used to, you went to the school that you grew up cheering for, you was there for four years, um, but now they don't, you know, and you was there to play for a certain coach. They don't care about the coach now. They're there to get the NFL. Yeah. I mean, that is one thing that over the years has really impressed me about these players. They make, they're making business decisions. You know, and I don't, I don't know that I could have done that when I was their age. You know, when I was seventeen yeah, yeah. years old, you know, sixteen years old, hell, even eighteen old. years old. There's nobody that could have. If I had have had a legitimate shot at playing college football, there's no one that could have ever taught me how to go into Alabama. Absolutely not. You know, there's and no and, and Alabama in nineteen ninety eight and nine. Not, you know, not their greatest years, did not the saving era. So, so like when people hear me say that, they're going to be like, well, who wouldn't, you know, no, this isn't the same Alabama, but I still would have gone. There is Absolutely. no one who would have taught me how to play in on the practice squad at Alabama because I would have been making the decision out of my heart instead of my brain. And yeah. You know, I I have an acquaintance who played high school football, Prattville High School, played with them, I believe they a year that they won the state um uh, state championship. And he chose to go and play at UAB. You know, um most people in his position would have probably tried to play at Alabama or Auburn, but you know. He wasn't highly recruited. He would have been going in, probably never saw the field, you know, till his junior or senior year, and then it would only been in garbage time. His football career is over. Well, he 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 knew I can go to UAB and I can play every game. I can start, well, which he did uh, for four years, you know, and then he went and got signed by the Baltimore Ravens. You know, and played several years, practice squad some years, some years on the active roster, but eventually ended up at the Green Bay Packers practice squad and had a career with the Green Bay Packers as their strength coach after he finished playing. Okay. So that was an outstanding business decision he made by going to UAB. So, yeah. There is, if he had gone to Alabama and played on their practice squad for four years, then graduated, then he got a college education, graduated, but he would not have ever played in the NFL, and he probably would not have been the Green Bay Packers strength coach, which he's no longer with them, but he was there for about five years. Five years, he was an NFL football strength coach. And he gets a, a, a pension for that. Yeah, he gets pension. He was in the NFL for probably, I don't know, he might not have made it. I I, I can't recall. I can't recall. He, he was definitely at least three years. I don't know if he made it to five. But, um, but still, it's like, and then he came into a strength coach at UAB and then Southern Miss and, you know, has had a very good career. And, um, that's just, you know, that, 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 saying that, that, like, I think a kid who grows up in California, you know, loving UCLA, USC, you know, kids like Bryce Young, who make the business decision to come to Alabama, you know, kids like Tua, who grew up in Hawaii, I'm sure he wasn't like a diehard Hawaii fan. You guess know, who because, he was. I mean, guess who, who is? Guess, <laughs> you know, guess, but, guess who he guess who he was. Guess who his hey, team was. Hey. Notre Dame. Okay, so you would think a seventeen-year-old kid would pick with their heart, and in that huh. situation, with him go to Notre Dame, but instead he chose with his head, and he went to Alabama, and now he's making money in the NFL. I'm, I mean, just like about 
you know, you say those guys, they went to play for a certain coach. Those guys aren't aren't going to play for Saban per se. They're going to play because Saban can get them to the NFL. Mm-hmm. Um, so that we we strayed from Colorado a bit, but I'm going to say this. I said, here is Colorado's Achilles Hill. I posed the question to you this past weekend. Uh Does Deion Sanders coach a down of college football after his sons graduate? That is an interesting question because, you know, a couple weeks ago, I would have said yes, but he made a mm-hmm. statement the other day about how he was coaching for his sons. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he may get out and go sit in the booth. Brother, I, mean, I because, think he's yeah. going to go wherever his sons go. Now, let me ask you this. Are his sons twins? I don't know. Okay. Are they, I mean, because I, I don't know. I don't know what year they are like. He may linger, like, if if one graduates a year or two in front of the other, you know, he may linger to finish up with the other one. But if you listen to his press conferences. Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard. It's all know. about him and his kids. He doesn't yeah. really talk about the others that much, you know, mm-hmm. and it's all about him and his kids. He's And he was re- – recalling an incident in one of the games where he he uh, he was interacting with his son and he said his son looked at me and said dad and that's when I said this is this is the farce you should never let your son yep. call you dad if you're his college football coach now if you're his little league football coach that's a different story but if you're coaching a Division One college program and your son plays for you and he's allowed to come up to you and say, Dad, on the sideline? Nope. You know what I heard that really – and I hope this is not true um, – that really that would disappoint me. I heard that Kirby's players call him Kirby. I don't mind that. You know what? Now? I think he. I, I don't agree with it, but I don't. I don't like it. I don't it. think. I, 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 I don't, I don't love think it's it, but I don't like. But I can. I can deal with that. I can't deal with. I mean, I mean, look, you and I played sports growing up. They played little league baseball, little league football, and had to put up with the coach's son syndrome and. And, you know, it was frustrating at times. And, you know, every – and then, of course, you had every guy and his brother who who didn't think their sons got enough playing time the year before that all of a sudden they want to coach now and the leagues let them. And, and next thing you know, you this what? guy that's played the outfield the entire time he's been Little League is a starting pitcher. And, yeah. and you know, we – Okay, that's in that arena. That's fine. Well, I mean, not fine, but I mean, whatever it is, it is. But dude, at the college level, you know, I'm going to play for a Division One college football team. I'm a parent. I'm going to send my son to play at a Division One college football uh, program, and the quarterbacks running around calling the coach dad you know and the the coach is doing press conferences and just talking about his kids nonstop. i wouldn't i wouldn't be okay with that at all not one bit yeah i mean because uh it's, I, I, I mean i wouldn't like that i mean um uh, I, I don't know. I mean, is this is the only reason they did this for his kid? I mean, didn't he coach their high school team? He coached some kind of like 
Mm. Email. It was some, yeah, it was something like a high school team. And then, you know, and then he was at Jackson State, right? And then he was like a little league coach because there's some guy, some kid that's been playing with him since he was like four years old. So, I mean, this has been about him and his kids from the beginning. And I think that, you know, at preseason, you asked me, does he want to coach Florida State? And I, I thought he did at the time. But after now watching this, I don't think he does. I think he, he'll go, you know, if his son, if Shadur, the quarterback, if he gets drafted in the NFL, I think he tries to get on with that team. I think he'd want to be on that team's staff. See, I don't think he can do it in the NFL. I think he's going to try. I think, honestly, I think with Dion, and, I, and hear me out on this. Yeah, when Dion was at Florida State, you know, he got away with everything. Mm-hmm. He got away with everything in the NFL. Um, I don't think that the way his personality is, he could go in there after being somebody who got away with everything that could not have control and let and would and had players getting away with everything to him that he had no discipline over. He's also a little bit of a media darling. Yeah. And the media loving. You know, they push him to the moon. I mean, you know, and I I don't know. I, I don't think he, I mean he's not gonna stay at Colorado. Probably, I promise you. One thing that bothered me. I say one thing that uh, you yeah, know, I don't think so either. One thing that bothered me with him is when he made that statement that um oh y'all didn't want to see the black man do it. You know, I thought, you know, forty uh, years ago when when you had like Art Shell was the first black coach and you know, like Sly Crew even in the eighties, uh yeah you, you yeah, you might have could have said something like that. But there is nobody that was pulling against Deion Sanders. I don't think anyone cares. The only people yeah, who care are care. people I mean, like him who care. who use it to their advantage. I mean, yeah, yeah. I you don't know what care. But you know what it does? It does yeah. He's got young kids there that's 18, 19, 20 years old. And when he's saying something like that, he's that, creating... That militarizes them, yeah. That racism is that racism is going to hold them back, and I mean, would you think twice if, if you had a you know if your kid was going to be coached by a black or a Hispanic or, a, mm-hmm. or anybody? No, I mean, as long as they knew they're doing, they, they, uh, yeah, true. I don't care. Hey, if he wins, yeah, I mean, hey, I mean, it's I think college football is the truest form of meritocracy there is. Hey, it's this simple. You want to stay here, win. I don't care what color this. you are, you know. I mean, win and you stay, you keep why. your job, lose and you find another one. Um. So you know, I was at this point, but you know, so prime, you know, got his wins. Um, I mean, who's going to win the, the? I mean, the big, you know, the Pac-12 or whatever it is now. Is it going to be Oregon? I think so. Uh, uh, USC looks stronger than they've been in recent years, but you see the way they kind of struggled with putting Colorado away. And let me say one last thing about Colorado, and then we can move on to the Pac-12 in general. One thing that drives me absolutely crazy about – about these teams is when you go out there and you say we beat ourselves and you put all the blame on yourselves, you really insult the other team. And it's like, it's such a defense mechanism. It's such. I know where you're going. It's such a lazy thing. It's like, man, y'all beat yourselves. Like, no, it's the other team that beat your ass. You know, you you don't cop out yourself. And now if if Alabama plays 
Appalachian State and commits 37 penalties and, you know, throws three interceptions where, you know, that they throw it directly to the defensive back. Okay. They beat themselves in that situation. Now, when USC plays Colorado and they go up big, you know, to Colorado's credit, they did come back and make it very close in the end. And and it's a hard fought game. And they look when it's a team that's the caliber, you don't beat yourself, the other team beats you. You know, it's okay to say yeah. we didn't execute where we needed to. I give a lot of credit to the we other team. Yeah, that, that that's one thing I've I'll, I've always admired Saban for is he always makes sure win, lose, or draw. He makes sure to give credit to that other team. This is an old professional wrestling rule. You don't want to make the opponent seem like nothing, because if you make the opponent seem like nothing. And you win, well, you just beat nothing. If you make the opponent seem like nothing, and then they beat you, you just got beat by nothing. You know, you want to actually build your opponent up, make them look great. They're the greatest team I've ever played. You know, and I mean, that's one thing that Saban, if you notice his press conference, he always does. It's like, they played an amazing game. If it was a close game, if it was they won by 20 points, if they lost, no matter what, he tells you that other team played an outstanding game. And I cannot stand that prideful, narcissistic BS for them to come in and say, it's my fault. We beat ourselves. No. Well, they I mean, beat if a you. Coach, uh, look, well, that's what, if, a co- if a coach wants to come and say, it's my fault. I didn't get a simple No, no, Shadur Sanders, the quarterback, said that. Okay. I, I, okay. I think I think Dion took some, you know, tried to put some of it on himself like that too. But, but I mean, okay. I, in I this particular case, coach I heard Shadur hey, Sanders. I'm the head coach. I'm the one that's responsible for getting us prepared. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. do my job. Um, I let the player. You know, that that's the way. Mm-hmm. You know, because uh, one thing Coach Brian all, always did was when they lost the game, he took full responsibility for it. And when they won a game, he gave all the credit to the players. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I just think that's the way. I, I'm kind of old school. Well, I mean, so, do you want to take a look at uh, this upcoming week? Well, um, do you want to do it now, or do you want to do it like we did Saturday morning? Um, I might be able to do something Friday night or Saturday morning, but uh, yeah, I'll say that because we've been going for like an hour, so we've been we've been that. going hard. Like my seat's sweaty. Yeah, my air conditioning yeah. broken. So I mean, we'll cut it now and. So, I mean, we want to wind down now? Yeah. And let's get, All get, right. Yeah. Well, uh, so I'd say the takeaways from this past weekend, I find my most impressive team of the, not of the season, but of the past weekend, I'm going with Kentucky. I'm, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I thought they, yeah, Florida was coming off a very emotional win uh, over Tennessee. Uh, they had all the momentum in the world. And Kentucky just put that fire out. I hey, guess, mean, what that... I guess what I say against Kentucky? Mm-hmm. That gives the team that he did that right there. He's, you know, he's getting the talent. Now they're believing they're – they're, they're, they're not believing to, in themselves, they're supposed, yeah. They're supposed to win these games. They're not supposed to compete. or mm-hmm. They're supposed to win. And they're going to be showing yeah. up to win. They're not going to be showing up to be competitive. There's no moral victories. They uh, want to go to Atlanta. I'm going to say the most disappointing team is LSU. I debated between LSU and, and Georgia. Um, 
Georgia, because I don't know where the expectations were on that. I think a lot of people were unsure about what Georgia really had in the preseason. And what I read and everything that I did read was, hey, Georgia's been on top of college football, you know, for the last few years. And until somebody knocks them off, they're number one. Um, that's okay. not real confidence inducing. Um, that's more, that don't mean, I don't know don't what they people. got. They're not what they're, I, I found their performance pretty disappointing. I thought they should have been able to at least do a little bit better against Auburn. But if I'm not mistaken, though, has it, hasn't it only been done one time? Back in like when they first started that AP in the 30s, that Minnesota won three straight uh, national championships. Uh, I believe so, but I mean, honestly, man, they were the first first time since Bama to do back to back championships, and Bama's was 11 and 12, and then. They were the only time in the BCS playoff series that you had a back-to-back champion. And You know, I still say to this day that 2013 was the best team Saban has ever had. It just wasn't the best was, day. That was it an outstanding was, team. I but think the that's they the best Auburn, team that didn't they just win. Wasn't the best, they just wasn't the best team that day. I, I think that they came and did not bring a very good game to Auburn that year. And then as far as their performance against Oklahoma, I just think they didn't want to be there. Yeah, I mean, when, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. his- that game cost A.J. McCarron his NFL career. And they said, because they, well, after A.J. McCarron got drafted, I can't remember what round he got drafted, and I think it was like third or fourth. But, um, you know, he came in as a prospective, you know, second rounder. Um, I honestly thought the Patriots were going to take him just because of Belichick being so fond of Alabama players. And then also that it was getting into that time frame that they needed to think about the post Brady years. And right. they took Garoppolo instead yeah. of McCarran. And, um, you know, I was pretty shocked about that one. And when the draft report came in, the scout said they were unimpressed with McCarron's inability to get the team ready to play against Oklahoma. Wow. He yeah, had the, the heartbreaking loss against Auburn. After and all the games he had won? That's what they said. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm I not mean, saying think about it's right. This, I'm saying it was just it was. 2011 LSU. I mean, um, you know, in that rematch. I, I mean, think it's pretty shitty that they judged him on that one game, but they kind of graded it on a leadership thing. I, I want to ask you something about that yeah. game. Mm-hmm. Do you, I don't know. I mean, uh, well, I can't remember what that was saying, but. Alabama, when they played LSU in that 2011 game, their the coordinator, I can't remember if it was Michael White Wayne or who it was, he developed the best plan for that game. Because if you remember, they were, you know, faking up a run to the right and rolling him out on a bootleg to the left and hitting those tight ends 10 and 15 yards down the field and just eating LSU up. Did you say there was a question? I said, do you remember? I said, do you not think that oh, was one of the oh. best game plans? I mean, because they 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 seen something from the first well, game. Well, the, I mean, the, the 2011 game plan in the national championship was obviously executed very well. I mean, it. I mean, what did we miss 
in that regular season game, like three field goals, including yeah, one in overtime. Saban, and if, if it hadn't have been Saban, for all that, we would have won that game anyway. Yeah, one like of the most – They took that pass down I, their way from on the goal line. Hey, one, one of the most boneheaded calls that I've ever seen that I don't know if the call came from Saban – or the offensive coordinator. But late in that game, late in the regular season Alabama-LSU game of 2011, Alabama was in the red zone. Mm-hmm. And they do a toss to Marquise Mays, and he throws a pass that gets intercepted. I, I remember that. Um, I'm sorry. I understand you're having this hard fought game and you want to get in the end zone. I understand that. And you feel like you need to resort to a trick play. But if here's the way I look at it if AJ McCarron is your quarterback, he's a Heisman candidate. He is, uh, I'm sorry, in 2011, he wasn't a Heisman candidate. Um, But he is, he's your guy. He's your quarterback. He's going to lead you to the promised land. The ball is in his hands. If you, if the game is on the line, I want the ball in my quarterback's hands. I don't care if Marquise Mays played quarterback in high school or not. I don't want yeah. him throwing a pass in that situation. I, I, I want me. McCarron throwing a pass in that situation. I, I thought me. if it's Saban me. had anything to do with that decision, I say it is the most boneheaded decision of who, his coaching the, tenure at Alabama. Tailback? Who was their tailback? I can't think of his name. Um, the stud that never made it in the NFL. Um, Richardson. Okay, talk about boneheaded calls. Mm-hmm. We go into overtime. Mm-hmm. First play from Alabama got the ball first. The mm-hmm. first play they run is a swing pass to Richardson out of the backfield. Mm-hmm. They haven't thrown a pass to him all season long. I'm mm-hmm. like, why did you just not give it to him four times straight up the middle? And he would have got. I mean, why do you try to throw a swing pass to get him out one on one? He. That, that was the stupidest call I could imagine doing on first down with them. Mm-hmm. I, I think, and, and tell me your opinion on this. I think sometimes these coaches, um, they tr- outthink themselves. Yeah, I mean, the swing. I mean, in, when we play it, Texas, it, it, it's certainly easy for us to, yeah, to to Monday Monday uh, afternoon quarterback this you know here twelve years later, but you know here here's the way I look at it. All right, overtime. You got you got that little. You don't go right into overtime. You have a little period where you can game plan. You know, I'm of the opinion that your overtime offensive possession should be the best offensive drive of the game. That should be where you get your money plays, your bread and butter plays that you know your team executes better than anything else they do. Now, unless you've exhausted those particular plays throughout regulation, it's like, this is the time we run what we run best. And you've got a few minutes to game plan this. There's no excuse for stupid things like swing passes. I mean, uh, uh, you know, and that game too, you mentioned saving for here's the thing that I questioned him on that too. That you know, that was a defensive game. 
is field position. Mm -hmm. Why was he attempting 56 yard field goals instead of punting and playing defense? Yeah. I mean, I could go for that. That was, I mean, that was a defense that, I mean, I think that, I think that the way he would look at it, though, is the confidence in that defense is why he tried the 50 plus. Okay. That's yeah, but, the first but at the right same there. time, at the same time, though, you're putting the defense in a really tough position because if they give up 12 yards, they're in field goal range. Um, uh, do you remember but that game? I, I we didn't I have a guy who could kick that distance that year. Yeah, I mean, we, we didn't yeah. have a Rikerd, you know. We, I mean, I don't need to remind anyone of the the horrendous, you know, history of Alabama kickers. Oh God, that I mean, sick. we didn't have sure shot. We didn't have we sure shots have at 40 plus. We didn't really even have sure shots inside 40. No, absolutely not. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that. One, one of these Do you remember, I think it was in 2014 or 2015, Alabama was playing Arkansas, I think it was in Tuscaloosa, and it was a game. And it was late in the third. Can you hear me? Hey, all right. You're back now. It was late in the third, early in the fourth. Maybe, you know, 30 minutes ago. Alabama was up like 10 to 7 or 7 to 3. And Arkansas had the ball at the Alabama 40-yard line. And, uh -huh. and and they come out on the field, and they try a fake punt <laughs> instead of pinning Alabama inside the 10 and playing defense. And the floodgates open, and I was like, why did you do that? Your defense was playing live. What out. year was this? It was either 2014 or 2015, because I remember Kiffin was the offensive coordinator. And it was mm -hmm. either 10 to 7 or 7 to 3 that Alabama was leading. And Arkansas pulled a fake punt from like Alabama's 45 yard line, and the floodgates just opened in. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I don't I, remember that one, man. Yeah, pull that back because I was just, you know, I couldn't believe it because I was like, their defense was playing lights out. I couldn't move the ball. I mean, hey, I'm let me inside. ask you this. This is something kind of uh, random, but I'm curious about it. Um, do you have the know how with the computer to broadcast? Like, let's say you and I wanted to review a game. So you would have to actually pitcher in pitcher broadcast the game into the the shot and you and I watch it and review yep. it in real time. I can study on that and figure out how to do it. Um I mean, because I see people do it all the time. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. I mean it's pretty I mean, common. There's it's a way gotta to be. Do it. Um, I mean, I, stuff like that. We should we should that might be a good feature or maybe for us to get going during yeah. the off season is reviewing some old games. I tell you, I um there is a there's a YouTube page. I think it's called Roll Tide eighty seven or Roll Tide nineteen eighty seven, one of the two. And they've got like twenty twenty to thirty minute versions of pretty much every Alabama game ever played and um i've watched some fun games on that we're talking about 1994 um you know 1992 you know 20 uh 2008 2009 you know 2011 i mean we're talking about some awesome be, classic alabama fun. games yeah that 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 would be a lot of fun to we actually, probably get a lot of viewership out of that. Yeah, I mean that would that would be a lot of fun. But but stuff like what you're talking about now, like watching these games in real time and and uh, and re-examining things like that. I mean, and it's funny 
you remember these games a lot differently than they actually happen. You know, um, um, uh, You know, you go back to when Peyton Manning was at Tennessee, you know, probably 95, 96. Um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, 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 I was in attendance at that game. It was at Legion Field. And His first play was like a 75-yard touchdown pass. Yeah, and if you look back on it, from my experience being there, I'm like, man, they killed us. You know, but then I went back and looked at the game. Alabama actually led that game, you know, for a while. And Tennessee started kind of pulling out. Like, Alabama led at the end of the first quarter, and then, you know, it it was tightening up at halftime, and then once – the third quarter hit. Then Tennessee started running away with it, but uh, but know, you know, I mean, it. it yeah, when, you look, little, when you look, when you you remember how it finishes. You remember I mean, how it finishes, but you don't always remember how it went. But I, you know, I remember my saying that Oliver's uh, defensive strategy was he was dropping. Eight ends of cover in the zone and rushing three, and Peyton was just sitting back there, just picking who he wanted. Man, I remember. I would have thought, me and my buddy was talking about it, and in my mind, I remember it being like 49 to 7. But I went back and looked it up, and it was the year that I played LSU, and they had, um, I, I'm going to try to call their quarterback. You there? Did you ever there and think about what your, your your favorite Alabama play ever was? Say what? Your favorite Alabama game? Did you ever think about what it ever was? Man, um, well, that's a tough question. I it is, you know. If you ask all these people who don't live in Alabama, they're going to say probably something like 2011 LSU, 2012 Notre Dame, you know. But while the Saban era has been amazing, you know, for those of us who have uh, been here all along, I can't help but think about the old games that we weren't expected to win or you never really knew, you know? Um, yeah, the, I remember those years. I, I remember the 1999 SEC championship. Oh, my God. And, and my grandfather, who was the biggest Alabama fan ever, passed away that day and Alabama even though they had beat Florida in the regular season was not expected to win that championship they were 
people were saying the stuff they say that nowadays, you know, well, this is the second time, you know. I don't but think remember, they can beat them. They twice were not before. supposed to beat all Florida that first time. That was down yeah. in the swamp right after they just lost to Louisiana Tech. And they won. And no one expected them to win. And not only that, they drilled them. Yeah, they they handled them pretty well. And, you know, of course, me, I'm biased because my grandfather passed away that day. You know, the world's biggest Alabama fan passed away earlier that day. And my family all got together and said, you know, we're going to honor him by watching this game together as a family. And I'll never forget that game. And my, oh, I'm sorry, you know, man. and then and then things like the '92 championship, okay, the '92 SEC that. championship. The, you know, the, yeah, that yeah. I, I mean, remember, but the '92 national championship has to be my favorite because every sports prognosticator in the world uh, that you know talk about football, they had Alabama getting beat by six touchdowns. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody. I mean, one guy wrote Alabama will be in the game, you know, two minutes. And I mean, what they did to them, um, there was a, I don't know if, if they put this defense in. I, we may have talked about this, but mm-hmm. they put this defense in uh, that was called Cover Zero. And mm-hmm. um, the, like, I forgot what possession it was, but they called it and all the players jump, was jumping up and down inside. And they go, Coach Oliver called it. Coach called it. And Cover Zero, uh, they had 11 players, all 11 new players walked up to the line. And uh, Toretto, they said, when they said that, so they see nothing but fear in his eyes. And he snaps the ball and just immediately throws it away. And they called it again. And they walked up to the line and he called a timeout. And he went over there and got on the phones and uh, was talking to the coaches. And they said, What the hell's going on? And they said, I don't know, just give us a couple of possessions and we'll figure it out. And he said, a couple of possessions? He said, the Bama game will be over by then. That's fine. Uh, let me tell you one more story because I know you got to go. Uh, here's, uh, this was an awkward one. This is one of the funniest stories I've ever heard. It was, um, this is for you just keeping up with it, but it was in 93, and Alabama was playing um, Auburn. That's when they went undefeated. Uh, and Alabama led in that game for a long time, but um. Stan White got hurt and Patrick Nix went in. And this was an Auburn team that was laden with seniors. And I think Nix was like a, a junior. I mean, like a freshman. And um, Nix goes into the huddle and he starts giving the, the players, you know, this raw, like, yeah, guys, we're going to do it, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, this fired up speech. The center looked at him and said, shut up and call the damn play. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember uh... – Anytime I hear Patrick Nix's name, I think of uh, I know when I mean you look back. I mean a lot of our childhood shapes us, but like I remember wandering down in my brother's room, my older brother's room. You know, he he had the you know where they give the older sibling the cool room. You know, either it's upstairs or it's downstairs. You know. And my brother had the coolest little layout down in our our uh, the bottom level of this one house we had, and and just hanging out with him for a minute one Friday night, and then a buddy of his came over, and his friend his friend walks in, and it's my brother who could care less about football. I mean, you don't meet anyone who could care less about football more than him. Just says, you know what, Chris. You and my friend Dusty here have a lot to talk about. And we're both looking at him like, you know, and this guy, you know, they're like 22, 23 years old. And he's like, why do I want to talk to this, you know, 14 year old? And he's like, because Chris, you're an Alabama fan. Dusty's an Auburn fan. And he's like, oh, okay. You know, and uh, we sat there and talked about the game coming up. And it was one of the years that Patrick Nix was quarterback. And I remember uh, 
that guy said, he's like, you know, man, Patrick Nix is the most inconsistent son of a bitch I've ever seen play the game of football. <laughs> He's like, he's going to throw one ball into the stands. And then the next thing he's going to, he's going to throw a strike into the end zone for a, a touchdown. And I do remember that particular year Auburn did win. But, but yeah, there, there were several memorable years of, you know, the Alabama Auburn games, you know, the Iron Bowl do, games. Do you know what that, you know what got the Auburn job? What? They was interviewing Dye. They said this is what sealed it. So, you know, Dye was in there as interviewing, and, and one of them finally asked him, because it had been nine years, nine or ten years that, you know, uh, Winsburg for Alabama, and they said, how long will it take you to beat Alabama? He said, 60 minutes. <laughs> That's funny. That's real funny. You know, for a while there, in those, in the, the after 92, you know, that mid-90s era, man, it was chippy. It was every yeah. other year. I mean, neither team ever won two years in a row. I mean, it it, it was every other year. and uh, It was competitive. You know, that, that It was very competitive. And, and, you know, it was back when they played the games at Legion Field every year. And then, you know, of course – Auburn argued that they wanted a home game, so they started playing in Jordan Hare uh, every other year. And then, of course, it took us forever to get a game into Bryant Denny because Alabama, when they were the home game, they were playing at Legion Field. But when Auburn was the home team, they were playing at Jordan Hare. And it's like, wait a minute. Yeah, Legion Field really isn't our home stadium. So. Why are we playing our home games here? Um, did you ever hear Di tell a story about that getting the game at Jordan Hare? I can't say that I recall. I mean, I mean, he made a good point. He said, "Look, he said, you know, we was going up to Birmingham, which is Alabama, you know, town." He said it's supposed to be even. But he said we're going in there, and the guys parking the car was a, you know, had an Alabama hat on, selling pop popcorn, was wearing an Alabama t shirt. He said. Um, it, he said, and it's supposed to be 50 50 ticket split, but it was still a majority Alabama crowd. He said it was an Alabama home game. I don't really know that Birmingham is such a dominant Alabama town, though. But Legion Field, you know, they did play, you know, about two or three games a year. That's where most Legion of Birmingham's big games were played at, was at Legion Field. Mm hmm. You know, because um, I forgot how many years he went with it, you know, not losing, losing Brian Denny, but most of his major games, you know, were, were played there, uh, like mm -hmm. Southern Cal, Notre Dame. I mean, um, you know, we, we, you know, but they, they made the right decision by ended up bringing them all on, on campus. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. I mean, for those who aren't from Birmingham, Legion Field is not exactly in a desirable area. But you know what, man? I went to so many games at Legion Field. And I, I went to in, a ton. Yeah. And I'd park in those folks' park, car, you know, their yard. And mm -hmm. I'd give them 10 bucks. And there was nothing going to happen to my vehicle. No, they were not going to let anything happen to them. Not Nothing was going to no. happen to them. They loved, yeah. they loved it. They absolutely yeah. loved it. They would let yeah. you park in their yard, the driveway, you know. And your car was going to be safe. It was um, going to be safe, yeah. They, yeah. They, they they wouldn't leave. Dude, we would come to our car after the game. They'd be sitting on the porch. Like, y'all enjoy the game? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. They didn't enjoy, <laughs> they'd be sitting on the porch smoking a, a blunt or something, you know. <laughs> but I was not uh, scared to go over there. Yeah. Um, no, 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 no. It. What, well, it wasn't that, but I, I mean, it, the stadium itself was pretty run down. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, when I mean, they had let the, you know, let it go down. You know, I went to a in a preseason game there. Mm -hmm. Back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. um, Falcons and Redskins. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. 
Okay. Um, what do you think? Do you think UAB really should have built a, a, a stadium or they should have stayed there? I don't know, man. I don't really know what they're doing. Um, well, they you know, 4,000 people coming to a damn game. Do they have that many? If that many. Man, I remember one of the, you know, my dad is not exactly known for his humor. And, you know, one of the funniest things I've ever heard him say was probably when I was about 11, 12 years old. And, you know, the UAB had become a football team for the first time, you know, in several years. And my mom walked in while my dad and I, we were watching a, uh, uh, we were watching football. And um, one Saturday night, my mom said, hey, you know, my mom and, and uh, my sisters went to the UAB game today to check it out. And my dad looked at her and said, oh, okay. Was there anyone else there? <laughs> it was, it's easily the funniest thing my dad's ever said. I mean, um, but, I don't hear them hop it all the time. You know, the 30,000 fans, you look, and there's nobody there. I, now, I will say this, you know, from living in Birmingham and in and, 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 and the, and the immediate Birmingham downtown district in UAB territory, the, the fans that they do have are very passionate. Yeah, and um, when the football program was given the death sentence uh, yet so again, um, you know, the way the fan base rallied together to get it to come back was was pretty inspirational. Um, so, you know, their fan base is very passionate. Um I didn't know they were drawing four thousand. I really didn't think they were drawing that many. But well, I, was, I was just I was giving them, you know, just throwing a number. Okay, um, two thousand. I would think it'd be yeah, more in that two thousand range. Now, um, do you remember though? But, but honestly, you look at all the, the these other small schools. I mean, they're that's the crowds they're drawing. Do you, you remember know, back they're, they're, in like the late nineties? When they kind of had that rivalry, Southern Miss, and they was actually drawing about twenty thousand people out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but let's just face it: you're never going to be build, you know, a team that's going to have forty, fifty thousand fans there. Mm-hmm. Because they just oh, do people no. with UAB. I don't think with... they'll ever build where they have ten. I mean. Yeah. You're you're building, you're trying to build a fan base, and perhaps one of the most dedicated college football college football fans. states in the country. And no, I think nine hundred and ninety nine out of a thousand people would prefer to watch the Alabama or Auburn game on TV rather than go and watch the UAB game in person. Because here's one thing I learned when, when I was going to the Alabama games every weekend. Fun experience, but you've got to accept one thing. You're missing all those games. You're missing every other game that's going to play because you think maybe you could watch them on your phone. Nope. You're in a crowd of 101,000 people. You don't have internet, buddy. You know, and you're not going to have it till you get about 30 or 40 miles away from Tuscaloosa. And so, yeah, it's everything. So, if the... Alabama game is not a marquee game. Let's say they're playing, you know, um, they're playing Arkansas. They're playing Tennessee back 
you know, in the years when they were just a, a, a cupcake game. You're you're playing Kent State. You're playing Middle Tennessee. You're playing Chattanooga. You know. Yeah. I mean, do you really want to be there? Do you want to miss, you know, Auburn and Georgia? Do you want to miss Auburn and LSU? Mm, do you want nice. to miss – yeah, do you want to miss Florida State and, and Clemson? You know, I mean, it's like – I like the Ken- football. Um, Obviously, my 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 main focus is going to be to watch Alabama football, but right. I like football, so I like to watch all the games. You know, I, I love to be able to have, especially you know now they on YouTube TV they've got that multi view. You know that's great, but. Um, but if Alabama is playing some cupcake game and they're up 28 to nothing at the end of the first quarter, I don't want to watch that game anymore. Honestly, right. you know, I want to put it on. You know, maybe Ohio State it. is playing, you know, I, I Michigan like to State. Back I want to rather watch quarter, that, you know, to see who to see the, um, um, you know, the second stringers play. I, I do we'll flip back over and watch that. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's, so we got it's, it's always nice but to, to watch things Park like that. And if, there, hey, if there's nothing else to watch, that's fine. But, I mean, if there's another game on, you know, Florida's playing Tennessee, Auburn's playing Georgia, you know. I, um, do you know I, I would just, you know, I, I would be more interested in watching the other game. I agree with uh, 100%. So, are you going to ask those football fans? Because let's let's yeah. just be perfectly honest. There was nobody who was born and raised a UAB fan. There was nobody. There right. was nobody. I've, right. You know, Absolutely. Um, so, you're going to ask that person to give up all those other games and attend that UAB game. I wouldn't do it. I mean, no. Not in a million years. Um, I, I can't even imagine a situation where I would. Do you know what Bill Clark had almost had set up? They was fixing to you know, do all the co- contract with it um, before they canceled the program. And this would have been huge for UAB. He was going to have a two games to one of him going to Lexington and Kentucky coming to Birmingham. Let me go out on a limb and say UAB would have been an zero and two in those games. That, that they would have, but I mean, to, just to, to have that. Well, they went three games because they were going to play mm-hmm. two in Kentucky, oh, one in Birmingham. But just to say that, hey, you know, we just played an SEC team. Um, I mean, I mean, hey, I don't. I love the decision. I mean. But when you think of the caliber of the teams that UAB usually plays, I mean, you think back to when we worked at Jim and Nick's and we would we would uh, have that one team that just loved to come in and, and oh, from, eat uh, at our restaurant. That was, yeah, it was Western Kentucky. Okay, this isn't Kentucky. It's Western yeah. Kentucky. Right. Now, I don't know how competitive that team was with UAB. I didn't keep up with it, but – that's their competition. East Carolina. Well, was they or was East they Carolina the is their competition. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, I mean, it, it's not saying that you can't have good players. It's like I talked about my friend who, you know, went to UAB and was a, a great player and played in the NFL. And uh, what was that quarterback's name? He played for the Vikings. Um Joe something or another uh, that went through that played UAB and then he went and played it, you know, for the Vikings. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, not to mention that it was a time for the Vikings that you or I might have had a shot at that playing quarterback. Um, yeah, but um, I mean, it's not to say that there's not great players that come through the Conference USA. In UAB and schools like Western Kentucky and East Carolina, but 
There might be great players, but it's not exactly the greatest games you've ever seen. I don't, I don't think there's anybody, you know, rearranging the plans of their day to go see it. No, except for Steve. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Him and Chan, man. Well, they sort of that I are. bet those two had never attended a UAB game in their life. Do you, no, listen, do you think Chan was gay? Are we still, <laughs> are we still recording? I'll, 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 I'll edit this out. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. As a matter of fact, um, and I think uh, his I, thing was black guys. He had a thing for young black, black yeah. males. Yeah. Yep. Yes, I I yeah. agree with that. Yeah, I'm um yeah, I I I I yeah, I always yeah, knew that. Um mm-hmm. you know, he he he's trying to get Zach to go to Florida with him. But I like Jim. Oh, I love Jim. I um, I could, he was so cheap though, dude. He's very cheap. Yeah, he I mean, as much money cheap. as he made. And Steve, I just, I didn't like Steve at all. Steve was a a, a weirdo. Well, one the thing that I finally when I quit talking to him, and you know, most times it, it it I don't get offended by it. It doesn't bother me, but just. The, from him and the way he said it, 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 that you ain't nothing but a fucking faggot. He said that? Steve said that to you? Yeah. That's and funny. Claiborne told me, he said, why didn't you tell me? I said, I don't know. But he said, I would have banned him. I said, you know, that, I don't, it ain't that deep. Um, you know, I just, I, I just never have enough, no use for him. Yeah, and, and like I said, most of it doesn't bother me. I mean, because I, I don't get offended, but just the way he said that to me, I was like, mm, fuck you. That's funny because I would have imagined you coming back and telling people what he said and laughing about it. Nor with most people, I would have. But yeah. it was just, it, I guess I just despise the man so much. Because I, I don't think the it only was thing, what he said, it was that it was him. And yeah. 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 Because the only thing I used to hear from this man all the time was me being an Alabama fan and, you know, Tuscaloosa and the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. And why won't y'all play? It just, you know, and that's something I heard from the man constantly because I was an Alabama fan. Do you rem- were you there the night that, uh, Oh, who was it? I think he was the governor at the time. Uh, came in. I waited on him. Huh? I waited on him. We, who was that? Robert Bentley. Okay, that's right. Um, His wife and three of their aides. Mm-hmm. And uh, George was the general manager. And George, because I mean, let's face it. I, I mean, I was I was the best server at that restaurant. Um, he he put them with me for me to wait on them, and so I waited on the governor and his three people. Well, at the end of the meal, for whatever reason, George decides to comp their entire um, tab, and it was like one hundred forty dollars worth of food. Yeah, and the governor. And his other table both left a five dollar bill. Oh my gosh. That sucks. I mean this guy was a you know, before his governor, he was a doctor. I mean, surely this guy knows the mm-hmm. etiquette of, you know, tipping and, and I was like, You just got and you that's all you tip. But yeah, I was I mean, that's something but yeah. Yeah, I, but yeah, I remember when the governor came in. Well, anyway, when he came in, I remember Steve was all like, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to go and I'm going to say to him, go Blazers. I'm like, you know what, Steve, you do that. You do that, buddy. Um, and you want to know what one of the coolest tables that I've ever had was? This is long before you worked there. This is when I um, I had been working for Jim and Nick for a while, but it was like the first time I had ever waited tables there. Um, and I went up to this table. They sat them right there at 68. And I approached the table, and as soon as I did, this guy holds his hand up, and he said, Bob Budweiser's. He said, I don't want to know your name. I don't want to know what any specials are or anything else. We want five Budweiser's at this table. The quicker you get them here, the better your tip's going to be. I'm like, I'll be right back. And I went to, uh, you might not have known this guy, uh, Fahid. This is when Fahid was uh, one of the main bartenders. I'm like, hey, brother, you know I would never ask you for this without ringing it up again but if you give me five Budweiser's right now I'll love you for the rest of your life and he gives me five Budweiser's and I care and so I got those Budweiser's to their table in about 10 seconds and they're like all right and they're like we'll we'll take menus now <laughs> it's like those were the old old days of uh five points was, uh, the coolest fun time. um one I waited on was what's that guy's name? Is it Anthony Bourdain? Oh the, yeah, the, I forgot he came to the store. The chef time. rest the chef restaurant impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I remember he came. I was fixing he, to get cut. Mm-hmm. They put me in the forties for some reason that night. I was fixing to get cut. Nobody's in the fifties. One table in the sixties, and they seat me at like eight fifty, and I'm pissed. Mm-hmm. And I go up to the table, and my body language is showing off that I'm pissed. And I'm like, you know, what do you want to drink? I get it to the first person. I get it to the second person, third person. And I look at him, and my eyes just went up. And I said, oh, my God. I think his name was Anthony Bourdain. But I said, oh, my God, you're Chef Anthony Bourdain. He said, you're absolutely right I am. I said, Chef, what can I get you to drink? And I go from, you know, to super server then um uh waiting on that table because i was like oh my god i can't remember waiting on this guy and um uh, I, I mean uh at the end of the meal you know i brought out you know all of our desserts for him to try and, every, and everything and uh um you yeah, know worked out uh but i mean I, I, I that's not i've ever been scared waiting on the table because <laughs> i'm here i am waiting on you know top shelf so I'm fixing to fuck something up and I've already you know showed attitude I was like god oh, this is gonna end in a disaster yeah you know this wasn't uh this wasn't at Jim and Nick's but man one time I was at um I was at Buffalo Wild Wings with a buddy of mine and he looks at me and he's like dude there's Charles Barkley I'm like what and I turned around and there's Charles Barkley. And um and so he ends up sitting at a table like right behind us. Like just seriously, like one table over. He sits down. And so this this was I don't know if I said this, it was Buffalo Islands. And there's a girl waiting tables there. I, we went in there all the time, me and this buddy of mine. And there's a girl waiting tables in there that is um, that's pregnant. And, you know, so, I mean, it's like you see the pregnant woman waiting tables. It's almost like you would hope that you could summon up a little compassion, you know, and like, wow, look at this hardworking woman. She's pregnant. And here it is. You know, one o'clock in the morning, she's here waiting tables. And so she walks up to the table and said, hey, you're Charles Barkley. And he kind of is a smart ass. He's like, oh, yeah. 
oh, are you fucking serious? I'm Charles Barkley? No fucking way. And I, I looked at my buddy and I'm like, dude, what a dick. Who is that guy? I said, let's not even sit next to him. Let's just leave. Like, we're out of here. We're going to walk by you and not even give a shit that you are who you are. Um, but you know what I bet? What? Um, she probably got a hundred percent tip off him. They said that guy is one of the biggest tippers you will ever meet. Yeah. Not yeah, that didn't surprise me. I could, I could see him like being that guy who is a dick, but he'll then, then take care of he, you. On like, the tip. He won't hang around Tiger Woods because Tiger Woods won't tip. Oh, really? Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, I'm about. I'm about yeah, I'm about out. Spent, so. yeah. Um, I didn't tell you about my new puppy, did I? Oh shit! Ugh. Damn, stepped on a rock. My damn dog's brought in a rock. I stepped on it. <laughs> um, you got all sorts of. Well, how do you? What's the best way to deal with a bullying dog? Well, what I told you earlier, you know, stick him in the, um, get a, get a crate. And I mean, what you, what you can't do is you can't let him get away with it. You know, yeah, you got it really. Now, I tell you one thing dogs don't like. Now, my, my big dog, you know, the one that you said, you know, his head was as big as mine, Rex. Mm -hmm. Um, that dog, when we fuss at him, man, that dog shakes. He gets scared. You know, they don't like to disappoint you. You know, that's one thing you got to remember is that, look, look, I, I, you know, I love, I probably love dogs more than just about anybody on the planet, right? Yeah. But I'm not one of those, my, my dogs are my kids. I've got kids. My dogs are not my kids. Dogs are dogs. I just happen to love who dogs are. You know, but they are still dogs. So you that gotta one, remember man, he, that. He was as close got, to, I mean, that was as close to somebody as a kid. I know. I know. And and yeah. I mean I've had dogs that were precious to me, more pre more precious to me than most humans. Don't get me wrong, but they're still dogs. And you're a human. Right. Now where you and I would disagree, but you know, you asked me my opinion, so I'm going to give you my opinion, is, hey, in the book of Genesis, we were given authority over all animals. You know, man was meant to rule the well, animals. I believe that. And, well, wait a minute. I'm not so exactly, not, I mean, I'm not really, you know. All the shit not, you gave me all those years, were you messing with me? Look, I am not saying I am a total atheist. I'm just not saying okay. I'm a total believer. I'm just not saying I'm a, a total believer either. Um, okay, well, we'll work on you. Um, maybe that's a podcast we know. That'd be the most entertaining podcast ever because I've. You see, you got to understand something. Back when you worked with me, I didn't really know any theology. I'd read the Bible, but I didn't know theology. I've studied for the last ten years. I have learned everything so anyway but besides that though, oh, damn. we we have, part, yeah. yeah we Something we happened. we but, but anyway we have this authority over animals and animals recognize that authority so you've got to make sure that you assert that authority with that dog because let me tell you something there was there was something that a horse trainer taught me one time he said let me tell you something chris he said, these animals right here, they could kill every one of us if they want to. But you've got to convince them that that's not true. You can't let them know that. And I mean, right. I would say the same, a, a similar thing about dogs, because dogs could do a lot more damage to us than a lot of us realize. Yeah. And they are powerful animals and their, their teeth, their claws, you know, their strength. If they really wanted to attack, I mean, it, it, it would be really difficult for us to Especially fight them off. If you had a 120-pound so, Rottweiler or Doberman get on yeah. it, that would be, that so, could kill them. 
So the idea is to convince that dog that you're in charge. So what you've got to do is the second that Canaan shows that other dog aggression, you've got to square up on him and say no. Now, what I I used to do... What I was doing is I I was letting it get out of control before I stepped in. One time... One time... You got to step in immediately. One time Rex bit me on accident. He was going after one of the other dogs, and I reached down to intervene. And, bro, let me tell you, that hurts so freaking bad. Oh, God. Like, that dog's jaws are powerful. So I knew I had to... Um, assert some serious authority over this dog because this dog, he's powerful. You know, uh, uh, my my best friend has a dog. I don't know what he's a mix of some kind. Of, that is a powerful dog. He's got muscles for days. When he goes running, you can he actually feel the power in this dog when he runs around you. And I'm like, there's something intimidating about it. It's like, look, these animals are powerful. But what I do is I send the message to Rex. It's like, hey, you may be the alpha of the dogs, but I'm the alpha of the house. Now, with your injuries, you may not be able to do this. But what I used to do to Rex when he would go after one of the other dogs is I would pin him down. I would just get on his back, lay down on top of him, press him to the ground, restrain him, flip him over, and show him I'm stronger than you. What I do with Kane is I mm-hmm. immediately grab him by the scruff of the neck, and he goes down into a submissive position. Yeah, and I hold that's him perfect. For several minutes. That's perfect. Yeah, but look, I gotta tell you but, this for you. Mm-hmm. I was in bed the other night. Few weeks ago, and it's what I still going. I'm I still like out over this, but I was laying there and um, you know, just laying there in bed, and I felt something walk over me. Mm-hmm. Like that story you told me about your daughter. Yeah, she yeah. felt that she said she jumped up, says <laughs> she thought it, she felt the dog. It um, felt- let me <laughs> let me tell you the other part of that because I'm damn it. I've had a few glasses of wine and I may cry on this one, but so, you know, I, this, when, when Vince died, it was when I had started dating Christy and I, I mean, I, you, when I started dating Christy, I was immediately dad to the girls because their dad had passed away. They didn't, ha- and they were at an age where they needed a dad and it's like I kind of got drafted to that job quicker than most stepdads would have. And so, I mean, pretty much every Friday night when I got off work, I would come down here to the house we now live in, you know, and I would stay here till Sunday afternoon. And then I would go home to my house in Irondale. And um that I was here and I was do I was cutting the yard I was buying groceries I was doing like taking the girls places I was doing like dad stuff you know and then we'd go to church on Sunday morning and and, and you know it's like from Friday night when I got off work I was 90 to nothing doing dad stuff you know and then I always felt bad because, you know, I'd come home and my dogs have been by themselves all weekend. You know, I had a roommate and he would feed them for me but and let them out and stuff. But I wasn't with them and I felt really bad. And then, you know, it was in that time period that Vince passed away. And, and I was like, man, I, I just felt bad that I had neglected him um, during that time and kept leaving, you know, in the last few you know, weekends that I was going to have with him. I was gone. I was over here with the girls. And, and man, I had a dream one night. And I'm walking down this road and I see Vince. And I called to him. Because, I mean, it's like it was one of those dreams where I knew what was going on, right? I, I'm like, wait a minute. Vince died. How am I seeing him? And I'm like, Vince, Vince, come back. Come here, buddy. And he kept walking away from me. And I, he ran into this patch of like tall grass 
and um and I went into the grass and I moved it out of the way and I found Vince and he's sitting there and he's cuddled up with all these puppies and I was just like wow I felt like God was showing me he would have done the same thing you know he okay. understood he understands how this is you know, he understands that the father like, has the role. And mm -hmm. if he had to become a father, he would have left you to go to his kids. So don't feel bad that you left him to go to your kids because now you're serving your kids and so is he. When my dad and, died, mm -hmm. I was literally grieving myself to death. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I I was I took it extremely hard. Um, mm -hmm. I was just laying on the couch, just crying constantly. Mm -hmm. And I had a dream one night, and in this dream, I was talking to him, mm -hmm. and he was telling me the place that he was at, and he was telling me the different people that was there. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me that there were different levels that were for different people. Mm -hmm. And he told me, and we talked about other things. And he told me that um, they that they had went to go get somebody the other day, but had been turned back because it wasn't time for, for them to come yet. Mm -hmm. And and I can't remember how the conversation went, but. Anyway, I remember God woke up. I smoked like half pack of cigarettes, but I, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm not a really, you know a really religious person, but there's no doubt in my mind I was talking to him. Mm -hmm. You know, know man. I, 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 I okay. So here's where my take is on, um, on you know those who are deceased um you know i've seen my mom in several dreams i don't really think that those people are physically coming to us however i do think god can present them in an image of them to us that feels perfectly real um and I think that's his way of se sending us a message, you know, and I think he u not uses like in a negative way, but, but, but uses that appeal, you know, because look, let me ask you a question. You've probably heard, you know, a thousand times over that there's these two different guides. There's these, this, this God of the old Testament that was wrathful and, flooded the world and killed all these people and all that. But then all of a sudden you have this, this new God, you know, in the form of Jesus, that's nice and kind and gentle and forgiving and graceful and gave his life as a sacrifice for everybody. Yeah. You know, people like to talk about how there's that, those two different gods, right? Well, see, I don't think they're different. I actually take comfort in the fact that the same God who flooded the world is also the same God who laid down his life and allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. I actually take a lot of comfort in that, that he's saying, look, I'm just, but I'm also loving. I will be the lion if I have to be, but I would choose to be the lamb. And I don't know. That's just kind of a me thing that I feel a lot of comfort in that and that God extends the hand of grace. And so he sends forth things like that to us. You know, I don't think the literal Vince was in my dreams at that time. I think God projected an image of them that was truthful and faithful you know and i and I, i'm personally a believer that animals have that inheritance there's all kinds of speech 
about, and you read the Bible, there's all kinds of speech about animals in a redemptive way too. You know, in, in, in Romans 1, you know, when, when Paul says that all creation groans for the revealing of the Son of God, he then goes on to say, because the creature, meaning the animals, has a, a role in the redemption too. You know, so, I mean, I believe in, 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 a, in a divine, eternal life of an animal too. You know, I mean, maybe not a cockroach, but the, the animals clearly have a role in God's kingdom. And, and, and I think that when it comes to fallen loved ones, I mean, I've, I've heard so many stories about people like one of my favorite of all time. This might shock you, but you want to know what my favorite of all time, you know, moment of death, seeing into heaven situations is is the the comedian sam kennison now sam yeah, kennison yeah sam kennison right, right. grew up a preacher he grew up a preacher's kid he became a preacher himself and then of course he went kind of nuts but he also i don't know if you know this but he had a he had a brain injury he was in an accident and that's when he went like you know, off the wall and started doing comedy instead of preaching. And, um, and you know, he spoke favorably about his years as a preacher. He, he has a really funny interview on Johnny Carson where he's like, everybody thinks they, they just want to hear me say, you know, ah, let me throw this Bible away. Now, where's the party? He goes, no, nah, it didn't happen like that at all. You know, I mean, I mean, so he speaks very favorably, but you know, Sam Kennison, you know, he had his drug problems all those years. And then, you know, he was actually getting himself put back together quite well. And you know, he's in that car accident. Now, his brother, mm -hmm. his brother was present at the scene. And he ran to Sam's side. Sam had been thrown from the car, extremely bloodied and mangled. And his brother scooped him up in his arms. And he said, Sam was sitting there saying, this is at the eyewitness testimony of his brother. And he says, Sam sitting there saying, I don't want to die. I don't yeah, want to yeah. die. I don't oh, want to yeah. die. And then he just stopped all of a sudden and said, oh, okay. 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 And then passed away. And you now a very yeah. similar situation. My grandmother, I, I don't know if you remember when my grandmother died, but we were working together because you were working with us when, yeah, because you outlasted me. So when I, when I dated Lauren that we worked with, you know, Lauren Crandall, um, mm -hmm. this is about the time I started seeing her. Uh, so my grandmother died and, um, and, uh, you know, she, she had had some kidney issues and she had had a bout with pneumonia and she got put in the hospital and um uh there um you know her kidneys were failing turns out what ultimately ended up killing her was not her kidneys but her heart was having to work so hard to work with the failing kidney that the heart then failed. She was 82, you know, I mean, at that age, you know, when something like that happens, you know, there's really not much to be done. Um, right. But um, interesting thing. So, of course, my mom had already passed at that right. point. My grandmother had three daughters, you know, my two aunts that live here. And then I have one aunt that lives in St. Petersburg, Florida. And you now that aunt is kind of wayward and weird and whatnot. And, you know, she kept hesitating to come up. Well, my other aunts that live here, they keep telling her, like, you really need to come up. And so she finally he heads that way. So... 
you know, of course, St. Pete is about a 16, 17 hour drive from here. And so she, but she's working her way up here. Well, you know, one night my grandmother codes and, and my, one of my aunts is in the room with her and, um, and, you know, they're working on her, they're shocking her, they're giving her the, the paddles, you know, and, um, and at one point, my grandmother just, I mean, she's been pretty much out of it at this point for a good bit, and she just sits up and says, no, not yet. And, the, and they said when she did that, she's looking, looking up, you know, looking in the distance, you know, looking past the people that are working on her. And then she just kind of lays back down and, and, and rest peacefully. But she's alive. Okay. So the next day, my aunt gets there, comes and sees her. And then that night, she codes again, and this time she passes away. You know, and, you know, man, that one really always stuck out to me. You know, it's like, because, you know, my, my, of course, my aunt being emotional said, oh, she was talking, she was talking to daddy. And I'm like, no, I don't think she was. You know, I think she was talking to someone else, you know, and, and, and that's, they say, that's just me, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, I long for the day. I mean, I'm, I'm actually a full, I'm fully ascribed to the belief of the, the, the biblical doctrine and the end times. And I, I think we're on the doorstep right now. You know, there's a lot of things that were written, you know, 1800 years ago that are now being bullseyed right now. Um, and I'm also a big believer in the pre-tribulational rapture, you know, and um, I do believe that the arc, the metaphorical arc will be departing relatively soon. And um you know, um, but I am one of those people who I'm like, you know, when I think of that day approaching, you know, which there are some pretty significant biblical dates that we're right in the middle of right now. As a matter of fact, this week, we're in the middle of what's called the Feast of Tabernacles that celebrated by the Jews and has been celebrated for many, many years. Um, you know, going back about, you know, 3,500 years and, you know, we're at a pretty significant time. Um, but I think about, you know, seeing people like my mother again, you know, you know, my grandfather, you know, I mean, just, uh, my, my my buddy, I, I lost a friend when I was 18 years old in a car accident. Yeah, I okay. just adored that guy. He was one of my heroes, you know. And and I mean, I think about people like that. But 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 first and foremost, I think about seeing the Lord. I'm like, you know, I want to see those people. Yeah, I do. But I mean, I want to see the Lord. You know, yeah, I want to see the, the I want to see the Lord first. You know. I want to. Um, I got to call somebody else now because I got I got another one that I'm late for. So let's save this conversation. Good and we'll gosh, do man, yeah. you're just nuts. What are you doing? What are you about to do now? Uh, I'm this guy starting a, a Korean War podcast. Oh God, I can't help with that one. I was about to say if you're going on that John Benet thing, let me drop in. But uh, well, all right, man, I, well, I'll, 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 I'll try to do this. I'll try to do this. I, I can't say that we would do this by the time we do our next one in a couple of days. But I am. I don't. I don't work the next two days. I'm trying to kind of heal up. I don't. I didn't tell you. I hadn't had a chance to tell you. But 
I actually fell at work last week and I sprained my ankle pretty bad and I'm I'm having trouble walking. But the big thing is, is that I tore my tricep right off my, 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 the bone. Wow. The one we did uh, last night up to 174 views. Oh, really? Nice. Oh, dude. uh, I I picked up like, I'll send me subscribers off this. Yeah. But uh, um, but yeah, I, I tore you, my. You are tri- subscribed to the channel, though, ain't you? Yeah, I should be. Uh, I'll yeah, double check, was- but I'm pretty sure I am. But uh, uh, I'm gonna send you a copy of the first one we did. But uh, but but yeah, I um, so so I tore my tricep, tore it right off my elbow, and then I found out today that in addition to tearing it off my elbow. The tricep itself is split in a few different places. So, um, I'm, I'm pretty banged up right now. And, but I, dude, I hadn't missed more than 30 minutes of work since the day I fell. Um, uh, just keeping on going and, um, just I throw walking boots on and just, I use one arm, whatever I got to do to work. But, but we're going to take the next couple of days off because my partner, you know, he's thrown his back out now. So we're both, yeah. you know, beat up, old, and hurt. So we decided to take a couple of days to kind of heal up the best we can and and then try to work on Monday. So I've got a couple of days here. I'll try, I'll, I'll watch your shows and, uh, um, and I'll try to do some. But oh, hey, one oh. thing I want you to check out for me. I want you to look at America's Untold Stories on YouTube. Okay. And check out some of the material those guys got. Uh, uh, All right. We'll do do our predictions Friday. Friday night for the prediction show? Okay. All right, man. Sounds good. All All right. Bye. Bye.